All right, traders, let's get the SPACs attack started where we go over everything SPACs. So do me a favor, guys, before we begin the show, go ahead, write down that button. You see that share button? Click that share button. Let everyone know the best SPAC show in the world is on right now. All right, traders. Hey, I, I'm I'm really happy to be back with you guys. Like always, guys, on Spax Attack, we go over everything Spax and even some IPOs. That sometimes I know we got a ton and ton of headlines to go through. A lot of things going on. As you guys can see in the chat, we got a lot of loyal listeners out there that watch us every single day. And I think the big reason why they do it is because we built a community here. And, and so, w what better way than to bring my man Chris Ketchy on here? H how do you how do you like the community that we built, Chris? And, and what do you think about it? I love it. You know, I love interacting with our raving fans here in the chat while we do the live show. I know a lot of them follow us on Twitter. Um, I'm always happy, you know, to, to share thoughts with them out there. Again, just, you know, my personal opinions, not investment advice, but always willing to, you know, get that news and information out to people so they can do the research and, you know, uh, the investment themselves. All right, guys, I can see in the chat already, everyone's buzzing. What's up with that CO, CLOV? Uh, we'll, we'll get to it, Sue. I, I can guarantee you guys, so definitely smash the like button if you want to get to it faster. If I see for some reason, there's over like, l l let me check right now. So we got over 700 people watching on YouTube right now. If we get to 500 likes, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll skip right to it. But let's go ahead and let's get to some headlines. Chris. Take us back, my friend. All right, guys. Yeah, so try to get through some headlines today. And then we've got some exciting topics to talk about. I know everyone is itching to hear our thoughts on that Clover Health short report that is out. But up first, so headlines today, THCB, this is the company merging with Microvast. Uh, Oshkosh, which is a leading a uh, truck company announced a $25 million investment in Microvast. Um, so, you know, keep an eye on that one. Again, that was a deal that was waited on for a long time, a leading battery company. Um, so now getting, you know, an investment there from Oshkosh that's being brought to the attention of traders. And then we have XL Fleet, symbol XL. So XL Fleet announced a new deal. They're partnering with Curb Tender to develop an all-electric and plug-in hybrid uh, garbage truck. So they're going to jointly develop electric, uh, you know, and those plug-in hybrid, hybrid vehicles for the class three to class eight waste management vehicle options. That'll start this year in 2021. You know, so XL Fleet is one we've covered a lot, that electrification of those, you know, higher class models, uh, you know, part of the new Biden administration, electrification of existing vehicles. Uh, I think this is a great partnership for them. We've talked garbage trucks before. Of course, you know, Romeo Power has that deal with uh, Republic Services and then also Lion Electric working on garbage trucks as well. So huge opportunity to get all those garbage trucks on the road, turn to electric and XL looks to capitalize on that. Uh, two of our deals yesterday uh, were big movers on the day. So VCVC, those shares were up 49%. They, of course, announced that deal with REE Automotive. Um, that's an electric vehicle company creating the almost skateboard design, uh, you know, that uh, these companies can build off of. Huge opportunity. They have over $5.1 billion dollars in existing deals and up to $19 billion in their pipeline. No surprise that this was a hot flyer yesterday. Um, you know, so keep an eye out VCVC for, you know, buying opportunities on that dip as I believe this is a strong play in the electric vehicle markets, um, you know, with those existing deals, that huge pipeline of opportunity. And the fact that they focus on three different platforms where their competitors do one or two, and they also power, you know, class, more classes of vehicles. 
um, and their cost structure is better than their competitors. Those are all things that set them apart. So as we talk about the story, you know, look for those catalysts, look for those differentiating factors um, from one company to the next with so many SPAC deals being done and so many electric vehicle companies out there. Another big gainer yesterday was FTOC. Shares ended the day up 13% on that uh, SPAC deal with Payoneer. Uh, full disclosure, I'm still long shares of FTOC. I love the Payoneer story. Um, you know, this is a global digital payment company. They have deals in place all over the world. Uh, I've also seen chatter that they're working, you know, with eBay to replace PayPal in certain countries as the default option. But they work with nine of the top 20 most valuable companies in the world. That's a huge, you know, opportunity for them. They're also focusing and growing small businesses. They're expanding to new countries. They're in over 190 countries worldwide. Um, you know, so again, we talked that one yesterday, but pay attention to FTOC. Then one of the deals yesterday was actually down. So DGNR, this is Dragoneer, shares closed the day yesterday down 5% on that deal announcement um, for that software as a service company, CCC Intelligent Solutions. Guys, this is a good reminder. You know, DGNR was one of the popular SPACs out there. A good management team, but was trading at a, a decent size uh, premium right before that deal was announced. Um, so that's why it's important sometimes pay attention to these SPACs trading under $11. You limit your downside and you really have more opportunity to capitalize on a big gain on a deal announcement. Whereas a SPAC trading, you know, between 13 and 15 on that deal announcement, it's a mixed bag. Some investors may like it, some may not. And those shares could, you know, sell off as we saw yesterday. So, you know, keep an eye out for opportunities between 10 and 11. You know, this one just was not well received by investors. And, you know, as a result now, you know, people that were trading based on that premium, you know, are now in the red on that deal. Uh, APXT. So this is one of our favorites on the show. We, of course, had um, Avpoint CEO TJ Page on the program. Uh, so Avpoint filed their S4, um, no vote date set yet, but they did update their guidance. So they see full year revenue of 148 to $151 million for the current fiscal year. Um, again, this is a company that works with Microsoft and Microsoft just reported earnings and those cloud earnings were extremely strong Again, it's the continued trend for Microsoft that that cloud division and services is growing. And, you know, Avpoint is the company that bridges small to medium sized businesses with Microsoft. Shares were up this morning. They're actually down 2% now. Pay attention to this one because, again, they filed that S4. They didn't release a date, but that's the next step is they're going to say when that merger vote date is. And I think this one could get some more love when they uh, announce that deal as everyone's been waiting, you know, for that merger vote date. Our deal announcement this morning was VGAC. This was one we talked about on the show. We broke it um, live when that rumor was announced. So this is the Virgin Group uh, SPAC with Richard Branson. They announced an agreement to acquire 23andMe, which is a consumer uh, genetics and research company. So fiscal 2020 revenue was 305 million, but they actually see revenue declining. Fiscal 2021, um, 218 million. Fiscal 2022, 256 million. 3.5 billion dollar uh, valuation here. Um, you know, this is one where when that rumor was announced, people were not impressed and sold off. And then today we actually have a positive reaction. So we have shares up 10 percent right now. Um, the CEO of 23andMe uh, was on CNBC along with Richard Branson this morning. They talked about that. One of the stories for me here is going to be, um, you know, maybe how ARC plays this. And if Kathy Wood makes any comments, I think that's what some people are waiting for. So ARC, of course, has a genomics ETF, which adds some of the leading companies in the field. Genomics is one of the areas she's talked about the most for future growth. So she came out in 2015 with a tweet talking about how much data and information 23andMe had and sounded very positive on it. But over the years, she's also talked about their testing methods. And it seems like maybe she doesn't love the accuracy compared to some of those competitors that are already in the genomics ETF. 
So I think there's a lot of interest built up in whether or not Kathy Wood will include uh, VGAC or the deal after that, um, you know, in there. And I think we're going to have to wait and see. And at this point, I think it's a 50-50 shot um, and not a guarantee. So keep an eye out on VGAC. But we do have that declining revenue with the 23andMe business. And I will say the, the, the pair trade here for me, I own shares of Ajax, AJAX. So, uh, Ann uh, Wojcicki, the CEO and founder of 23andMe, uh, she was on CNBC this morning. And of course, now getting that deal done for 23andMe, she's one of the people behind the Ajax SPAC. And maybe now her attention shifts uh, to putting more focus on what company they're going to acquire. So, again, I own shares of AJAX. And I think that one is worth taking a look at. And then another headline that we'll touch more here in the middle segment when we talk a little bit about some sports betting is Skills, S-K-L-Z. So shares are up big today. They announced a partnership with the National Big. Um, you know, this shouldn't come as a surprise. Anyone who's watched the show, we had Will Hershey on from Round Hill. Uh, you know, he talked about Skills. Skills is included in both the uh, gaming ETF from Round Hill, uh, symbol N-E-R-D. And also the sports betting one, B-E-T-Z, um, you know, so uh, huge interest there. They have a huge opportunity to allow people to bet on video games and, you know, different competitions. Looks like the NFL is going to expand more into esports and utilize skills to do that. And I'll also note another, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise as the NFL invested in skills uh, prior to the SPAC deal. So they, of course, own equity in skills. So not only is this a partnership, but they own part of the company and they're invested in the future success of the brand. So definitely keep an eye on SKLZ because I think this is only the start of those deals. But again, we'll touch on that more later. Um, so that is it for headlines, Mitch. Uh, I know we want to get to Clover later on. So uh, what, what's going on? What's going on is that we got some movement. Hey. I remember a lot of people were worried, um, you know, with the whole kind of GME situation, we started seeing a lot of SPACs being sold off. And, and what, what this kind of was and what Chris and I kind of related it to was, you know, when you see certain stocks making, let's say, an 80% move, but then you're holding your SPAC that was, let's say, at 1020 and it goes up to 1040 for the day and back to 1020 at the end of the day. A lot of the times what you'll see is that investors pull that money that they feel they have tied up and they go and they r rotate it into something like a high flyer like you saw in GMB, AMC, and in, in that movement. I think that's why you saw these big pullbacks. That's why Chris and I did a show immediately that day and we said, SPAC's on sale, baby. SPAC's on sale. Because at the end of the day, when you get these discounted looks, is how you can really get a good entry on a stock that had rocketed up, you know. And, and we got to look for those opportunities so that we can measure our risk down towards the support and it not be so far. Like you, you, your distance should be smaller than that reward. You always want to be looking for at least a one-to-one -one look and then bigger than that. I mean, no one wants to be risking more then the probability of them coming into the green. So it, you got to balance that out. Create those trading plans. The same way you can create those trading plans for when things go wrong, like in, in CLOV. And, and we'll get into that in our middle segment here. But one of the things that we want to talk about, and, and I'm going to go ahead and let Chris go first and, and talk about what he saw in the short report about the company and why uh, Chris was also a little bit spectic on, on, on this company. And he was looking into it. And really, what we think is, you know, at the end of the day, it did get extended. So this could just be an opportunity to get in at a cheap price. But if we look at the weekly chart, and I just want to show that first, um, we're definitely seeing this big pullback. I mentioned it in kind of the morning hours that I'd be watching for this one to pull back closer towards this 1150 price point because you can see this resistance prior in, in June and July right here at this 1150. So let's see if it can get, hold that level and find some really kind of bottoming action there. All right, Chris, so what happened today and why did this one get hit? Yeah, so, you know, uh, Hindenburg Research yesterday said that they would have a new report out in the morning. 
So that report, um, you know, was rumored actually to be targeting a, a SPAC. And it turns out Clover Health was the target. So that short report came out today. And in the report uh, from Hindenburg, they call uh, Chamas Polyhoptia. It says how the king of SPACs lured retail investors into a broken business facing an active, undisclosed Department of Justice investigation. So this long report, you know, it really dives into that possible Department of Justice investigation, talks about the company being fined for uh, misleading marketing practices. Um, you know, so we talked about Clover on the show when it was trading between 10 and 11. And then it had this huge run up to like 15, $16. And a lot of that run up was fueled by some um, retail traders from different investment groups, you know, really pumping the stock up, right? And talking about, you know, uh, a Walmart deal, a CVS deal, a Walgreens deal. All these deals were, you know, existing and known. That wasn't new information, but I kept seeing the same stories, you know, shared around. Um, and so my thoughts on Clover were, you know, uh, you know, in that ten to eleven dollar range, it was great value. Once we started hitting 15, you know, I said I, I would be a seller up there. So the short report to me, there's there's some major concerns there. And Clover Health has not issued a statement yet. They said they would in the next couple of hours, which could be any time now. And also Chamath has been quiet about it, um, you know, obviously trying to figure out what to say here. And I will note, guys, I'm working on an article for Benzinga and I reached out to the company personally and they have yet to respond to that email as well. So really curious to hear what they have to say, you know, about the allegations against the company. And I know that when this deal was announced and, you know, was on CNBC, Chamath and the CEO of Clover, you know, I, I know Andrew Sorkin really dug into the terms of the deal, you know, how many shares Chamath owned. So, you know, this one was attacked from the very start. And, you know, so for me, the, from the business side of things, I want to hear how they respond to the allegations and if there is an ongoing Department of Justice investigation or if that was a past event that has been settled or if that is completely false. Um, but to me that they have not issued a statement, I've got to at least be a little skeptical that there is some sort of investigation. Now, turning aside from the, the company and the attack, Mitch, I know that this report, you know, got you upset today. Um, for a different reason. So if you, if you want to go into, you know, your thoughts on this, this sh short report um, from Hindenburg. Yeah, definitely. So one of the things that we want to state is that right off the bat, guys, you know, I, I'm not so much against short reports in general. I'm more against personal attacks here, guys. And, and, and this is where I really think, you know, it, it starts separating itself off here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually show you the report so that I, I don't misquote things. And that's why I'm going to be pulling it on the screen here, guys. Um, it, and this is really my opinion. This doesn't really have to do with Chris. If anyone wants to go ahead and hit me up on Twitter about it, go ahead and hit me up. You guys see my tag right here, uh, Story Investors. So I'm going to highlight exactly what I didn't like and what I did like. Um, and so one of the things that I definitely don't want to see is personal tax be included. Because in my eyes, guys, and you guys can all think of the way – to me, Chamath is a mover of the generation and a leader. Why? Because he's willing to speak up for the unspoken, the retail investor that can't go on these networks and really speak up. So uh, I'm going to take my second here to go ahead and point out some things, but you guys can can speak in the chat about it. See how you guys feel about this. That's what I, would, that's what I really want to see is more about the feedback that you guys out there, the retail investor has on what's stated in this report. Okay, guys. So let's let's start here. Um, you know, they state they state a whole bunch of points on why the report, but at the end of their points, they state this, guys. So and and let me know if you guys can see this on the screen. If you want, I can zoom in a little bit more. L let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more where you guys can read this. So it states here: short sellers have exposed almost every major market flawed in the past several decades. Yet there has been recent questions about whether short sellers and critical research researchers play an important role in that healthy functioning market. We hope our research today serves as a timely reminder that they do. Okay, 
I'm not even going to make a comment about that. That's just that's strictly for you guys to see it there. And then so where I really start getting a little bit upset on is where we get into the introduction part of this report. In the introduction part, we start getting into more personal attacks uh, straight towards Chambath. And, and then so you guys can see here, they, they try to do this kind of wishy-washy language here where they say, Chamath has expressed views we wholeheartedly agree with, right? And so they state right there that they wholeheartedly agree with this, but then strictly right underneath it, they go and they state this. But while we agree with the ideals su supported by Chamath, we are also skeptics by nature, and we are intrigued to see a billionaire taking media calls from his mansion, making hundreds of millions of dollars, selling SPACs to retail investors. And, and so all while positioning himself as the de facto leader uh, of the average Joe. And so what is this really stating? This is stating more along that Chambath is representing that retail investor. And what I really take an offense is referring to us as the average Joe. And, and, and the retail investor is no longer held back by information. This is the generation of information and we have everything out there. And so if you guys are holding information, the top, the, the hedge funds, the research companies, then what you're doing is you're holding us to a disadvantage. And that's when I really speak up, guys. If there's one thing I've always stood by is disrespect and seeing other people held at a disadvantage. So if you're going to go ahead and then start a personally attacking Chamath, you definitely need to go ahead and do a little bit better in describing why you want to go ahead and attack somebody that's trying to stand up for how they state the average Joe out there. So I, I know I'm getting a little bit emotional here, but at the end of the day, this is when I feel that we should stand up and fight, guys, because at the end of the day, uh, I'm with you guys. I, I do not feel that we are the average Joe anymore. I'm an informed trader. I make decisions based on information, not just based on momentum. And this is why Chris and I do every single day what we do on SPACs Attack is get you guys the information that you guys need to be informed in your trade so that these guys don't refer to you as average Joes. And, and that's really where we can stand up and, and start fighting back. What do you think about this, Chris? You know, Mitch, I want to break in here. Um, I just looked at my email. So I did get an email back from Clover Health, the company. Um, not a big surprise with the statement I received. So uh, this is from someone who works directly at Clover Health. Uh, the statement I have is, we'll be issuing a statement to address the claims presented by Hindenburg that I'll provide to you in the next few hours. Thanks for your patience. Um, so again, you know, the, the company is working on issuing a statement. The, the other thing I'll say again, and especially with that personal attack on Shamath that you called out, Mitch, and anyone who's watched this show knows that we're, we're big fans of Shamath, right? And, you know, even if I, you know, question the valuation on Clover Health, it has nothing to do with him as a person, right? It's, it's the valuation of the company. Um, and again, that SPAC deal when it's announced is based on a $10 price. It's not based on shares going up $20. So the, the personal attack to me, you know, Chamath could end up being on CNBC today, right? So they, they love him on there. He gets to go on whenever he has deal announcements. And the fact that CNBC covered this this morning, you know, from the opposite side, right? They covered it from the Hindenburg side and they didn't have a rebuttal from Chamath. I think he needs to get on there, um, you know, and really talk about the, the allegations and also maybe he needs to call out Hindenburg, right, for that attack that they put on him. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm with Mitch. I, I'm not against short selling. I'm not against short selling reports. I'm not against calling out red flags and, you know, allegations. But th this attack did seem very personal. And it comes at a very bad time, too, right, when Shamath is, you know, creating value for retail investors with these SPAC deals. He's taking the side of the people, right? So, the report can call him a billionaire and can call him all these other things. But, you know, Chamath is very, you know, easy to, to get along with and see his side of things right now. And, you know, he's very good at what he does. Um, you know, I know Social Capital, his company just hired a bunch of people, you know, that are retail investors that had to pitch their ideas to him. And now they're going to manage money, you know, for the company and invest in these, you know, uh, growing companies and publicly traded ideas that they see. So again, sharing the wealth and the knowledge with the everyday investor. 
Um, you know, I really want to hear what Chamath has to say about this deal. And then from a, from a, hey, a before, before we get a little bit further away from that, you, you know, I, I completely agree with you. I, I definitely want to hear what Chamath has to say. So I, I'm going to put it out to you, Chamath out there. If you want to go ahead and speak to the retail investor, I got nothing against CNBC, but we will represent you in the best way possible, which is the way that you want to be represented, which is to the retail trader out there so that they can have the information that they need to be informed traders. So if you're out there listening to this, Jamath, we need you to come on to Benzinga today so that we can get the correct answer and the message across that you want to get across to the retail trader. And, you know, so Mitch, I was going to say, you know, from a from a SPAC perspective, from an investment perspective, again, if you if you like the math and if you believe in his ideas, you know, I will say that this short report now is hitting his other stocks. Right. So IPOD, which I own, IPOE and IPOF are all are all down today. And, you know, part of that, it looks like just across the board that people now are going to question some of his SPAC deals, right? Because one of the things that called out was, you know, how much equity, how many shares Chamath got in that Clover Health deal. And guys, this is where the short report scares me a little because when we talk about this disclosures and all that, you know, the SEC and the DOJ could be coming after SPAC. And, you know, the, the thing we try to do again is give you information. So I read through the, the press release and I read through the presentation and the thing I've said that I think is going to change is when you hear a deal announcement, if you pull up the press release, it doesn't break down the percents. If you pull up the presentation, it lays out in a pie chart, right? And it says, you know, existing shareholders, 80%, pipe shareholders, 10%, you know, Clover Healthcare shareholders, as an example, 10%. It breaks down who owns what after the deal goes through. I think that information needs to be in the press release. And I think that's one change that happens, um, you know, to kind of soothe over uh, this deal here. So, you know, to me, if, if you believe in Chamath, if you believe in those existing deals, which take a look, I mean, SPCE, OPEN, MP, DM, these ones that he did the pipe on, you know, his, his facts are on sale today from where they traded yesterday. So, you know, and then the other thing I'll say is, you know, again, he hasn't issued a statement on this. He actually tweeted yesterday, and this one you can really dive into a little bit. He said, SPACs may be easy to raise, but they are hard to execute and success isn't guaranteed. Good luck to all the players. So is he taking a dig at the number of SPACs that are out there and saying what I've been saying? Maybe we need to see those numbers come down. Or is he taking a shot at you know someone who may be competing for a deal with him right now saying, Good luck to all players. So is there a bidding war going on behind the scenes that we don't know about with IPOD or IPOF? IPOF shares actually were up double digits last night. And I don't know if it was based off that tweet or based off of rumors, but, you know, SPACs are on sale in Chim Chamath World today thanks to this Hindenburg report. So, you know, we'll let you know again if any breaking news comes across or if I get a, an email response again. But that, that's, that's my thoughts on the, on the Clover report today. Yeah, just to leave off, uh, you know, I definitely want to go ahead and, and, and we definitely need that answer from Chamath. So I, I'll give a shout out right here, guys. Uh, I don't give too many. Hey, guys, everybody, let, let's go ahead. Let's tweet at Chamath. Let's let him know that Benzinga is here to give the honest answer for the retail investor, the one that they're referring to in this report as the average Joe that Chamath is representing. So if he, if you guys can help Benzinga hit that tweet button, let's, let's get at him. Let's get, let's get him to hear us out there watching right now that want him to answer. And, and we, we don't need him to be going on kind of these, and I'll say it, these old media sites. Uh, we are the new method here at Benzinga. We try our best to engage with our viewers. And that's why you guys have a chat right now that you guys can let us know what you guys want to talk about. You guys can hit the comment after and let us know what you want to see on the next show. And you guys make the call here, not us. And, and that's what the important part is here. So I'm going to move on here because I, 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 you know, you guys can see I'm a little bit emotional on this. And, and the big reason why is at the end of the day, SPACs 
have led to wealth to the retail investor. It usually has not led to just these hedge funds and institutionals making money. I can see it and I have seen it on, on Twitter and, and just from our viewers that it has gave wealth to the retail investor. And the reason why we do this every single day, guys, is so they cannot refer to you as the average Joe because you are informed. Because Chris, my man here, works hard every single night, hours, to get you guys the information that we pull for SPACs Attack. So uh, I'll go ahead and I'll pull the banner down. We'll pull the, pull the arms down. Uh, you know, the shields can come up, you know, because, you know, the shield wall was up there for a little bit. So uh, let's let's pull it back. L let's let's do some ticker time. L let's let's calm it down a little bit and, and take it back here. All right, guys. So one of the, what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to pull up the watch list here and then you guys start putting those tickers in the chat that you guys want to see. Chris and I will take a look there. If you guys have any questions, we can address also. But let's go ahead and let's keep moving here. Let's get some tickers rolling here. Of course, CCIV. Rocket, why wouldn't you want to see CCIV? Uh, I'm going to skip that one today because I feel like we've been doing too much coverage towards that one. And, and sometimes you need to cover the smaller ones, the ones that aren't moving right now so that people can find them. So let, let's go ahead and let's keep moving here uh, i'm seeing one mentioned here ftnt by john uh, so do, do you know anything about this one chris did you say ftnt i don't think that's a fact. whoa they got me you, you got me there john hey yeah. hey john jason rasnick pick that they probably heard um uh, I he uh, talked uh, um, look at these guys trying to get that power hour stock because it's ripping through. You, you, you're trying to pull a fast one on me there, John, and, and you got me. But hey, I'm pulling back here. All right, so let's let's keep rolling through here. Um, so when does Romeo start gas? <laughs> so l l l let's see the Romeo chart. All right, so uh, you know, full disclosure, I, I was looking at this one this morning. This morning, guys, uh, I'm looking at this one trying to trying to time my entry. We've talked about this plenty of times. We're at the support, but are we going to be able to hold this $18? It's 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 not looking like we're getting that drive. But one thing we have to keep an eye out for is the earnings that are coming up, right, Chris? Yeah, it looks like earnings are coming up in a couple days. And you know, I, I guess the question when Romeo start gas, uh, maybe <laughs> again because if you look at that chart. I mean, I, I I see some gas back in the day on this one. So uh, <laughs> when I'm still looking at getting in long term, um, you know, that $18 level I'll play with today, I might even set a limit order below 18. It looks like we did hit below 18 earlier. Um, great battery company. And, you know, I, I can't say again enough about, you know, my thoughts on this one being a, a great long term play on electrification. All right, so the next one I'm seeing mentioned was one that had earnings yesterday, which was the United uh, one, which was, it's a UW, uh, what's the ticker name again? It's U UWMC. When they change over, man, I, I start losing them. <laughs> I don't know how Chris does it, guys. <laughs> well, those clever names, like we talked about with tickers yesterday. I mean, you know, that butterfly, B-F-L-Y, you're not going to forget that now, so... So if I can remember clearly, I, I think the the merger vote was on, was it in the 19th or was it over here on this kind of 14th level? I think it was in the 14th level. Okay, so so just, just to describe the wave, guys, this common wave, guys, after the merger for it to come and, and come back into the what we call the evaluation period. When it's doing a pullback, because once the merger hits, a lot of people are trying to figure out the fundamentals of the stock and the fundamentals well, that's it. that's how you start breaking through technicals guys because people are looking at fundamentals and, and, and thinking about revenues versus where the stock is and, and trying to evaluate hey look how this one pulled back here it, it went all the way past this low i i haven't seen one that can go this low guys um so right here we got towards a low of 920. look at the first tick on this one the first tick on this one was 930. That's one thing I have not seen. And I, I want to point that out because that, that's very uncommon, right, Chris? Yeah, you know, this one dipped 
uh, you know, below 10 there. And, you know, I, I, I don't have a lot to say about earnings from yesterday. It, it, it was no surprise, right, that their numbers were strong um, with strong numbers for mortgages and housing. They also announced a dividend of 10 cents a quarter. That was known from the start too, guys. So not a lot of new information. I think everyone, you know, expected blowout earnings and this stock to skyrocket. This was the largest SPAC deal done in history at a $16 billion valuation. That $16 billion valuation was based on that $10 price. As you keep going up from $10, this company is worth over $20 billion. And I just, I don't see it right now. And again, this is one that got too many retail traders, too many, you know, trading groups pumping the stock up saying it was going to hit $30, $40 and have this insane valuation. And as we talk about those disclosures with the percentages, shareholders of the SPAC only came out with less than 5% of the company post-merger. So, you know, this was very small. The company is still widely owned by the existing investors. So, you know, th this is one I have not been in. And, you know, I, based on it not getting that action yesterday from earnings, I just don't know if it's going to get, you know, the up movement again in the short term. Hey guys, you know I, I'm in the, I'm in the some competition stocks with this one, so you, you could look at you know replay. Uh, I'm in this one, and it started to get a pop today. So really excited about seeing that lift, um, based on the, the the thought that it could be moving off on that move based off of the the earnings that came out there. Another one that I'm in, guys, is, is Rocket. But just want to just tell everyone because that's also a, a competitor, and it's actually up today. So I'm going to be paying attention towards that one, up about four percent. Let's see if we can start getting some drive in the mortgage, and then what you can do is you can start timing that UW. Uh, MC and, and then start trying to maybe find the bottom on this one and so that you can get in maybe when the whole mortgage companies all make a rip maybe this one lags and then follows after uh, I do this often guys which is called the laggard play and, and so you guys can look into what a, a laggard play it consists of and it's a lot about relationships between the industries so let's go ahead and keep running through here I'm seeing mention of LCY LCY so so what's up with uh number what is it number three here yeah so uh lancadia this is the one that was done for hillman group this is a fastener um you know a materials spac deal they they sell they get over 50 percent of their revenue from home depot and lowe's but they're in a ton of stores right for home improvement um you know so not a, you know, quote unquote, sexy deal or sexy brand here, but they've been around for years and they've actually experienced growth. I think when I did my article, it was growth in, you know, every year, but one of the last 15 years or something for revenue. So steady, steady growth. Um, you know, this is one again, that just did not get the attention because it's not that huge, you know, total addressable market or, you know, electric vehicle play down the road. But guys, this is one where steady growth and, you know, maybe steady wins the race in the long run. Right. So seeing in the, in, in the chat here, uh, a couple more mentioned here, let's go ahead and keep running through here. Uh, let's go to uh, Snack Crackle Pop, SVAC. Starboard, the star. What's up with the starboard? Yeah, so starboard, um, you know, this this is a huge SPAC, right? And it got lots of attention based on that large name. Um, you know, I, I, I like this one, uh, you know, but again, it's trading at a... a decent size premium, but really I'm actually surprised it's not trading higher than, you know, $11.50, $12 with that strong brand name, um, you know, those huge names in the management team. So this is one I know I've taken a look at um, because I think they land a, a, a great long-term deal. All right. Getting mentioned here by my man, Danny, Danny asking about HEC, HEC. Yeah, so HCC I own shares of. Um, this is the company acquiring Talkspace. So Talkspace is a leader in online mental health, right? So telemedicine was a huge story in 2020 with the pandemic. And 
you know, the when the pandemic, you know, hopefully goes away, people will return to doctor office visits. But is that going to be 100% again? No, a lot of this, as we've learned, can be done, you know, over a computer, over a phone. So talk space is the, the mental health side of that. And the pandemic has also grown, you know, people suffering from depression and, you know, those thoughts to where they need a company like Talkspace where you can get out your phone or get on your computer and you can talk to a licensed psychiatrist and get those thoughts out there. So to me, this one didn't get enough attention and they have, you know, marketing deals with Michael Phelps and Demi Lovato. So they already have brand awareness. They already have commercials on TV. I think after this deal is done and with having some more of that cash, I think they're going to tackle marketing, you know, grow their app. They're going to put more commercials out with Michael Phelps and Demi Lovato. And, you know, I still own shares. I think this is a, a great long-term play on the digitalization of the healthcare market. Yeah, guys. So I'm going to keep rolling through here. going to go to GNPK. I had a question that's, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I wish I kind of had this one, but I, I really don't have it, John. Uh, they, they think that I'm in this one, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not in this one, GNPK, but we can take a look at it. So, uh, so what's up with GNPK, Chris? Yeah, so GNPK was one we talked about yesterday um, as possibly being connected to space. Um, so they're targeting aviation. They have the former CEO of Delta and Amtrak, and then the former CEO of Frontier Airlines. Um, you know, so again, are, are they going to go after an airline when airlines aren't a, you know, growing business? I don't see it. I see them going after, you know, urban air mobility, right? Or space, because those are the gross markets. So, you know, this one has a great management team. And again, as we talk about SPAC trading between 10 and 11, here's a perfect example right here. Yep, perfect example. Sideways action near that level, so giving you an ability to go ahead and measure risk down towards this level, which is right at the 1015 level. And then what I would like to see on this one is I would like to see a strong pullback come and test this kind of 1040, 1035 area. If I would like to get in as close as towards that up uptrending support line i want to get close towards that support line to give me a potential for this one to come back up and get right back towards the resistance and maybe get back up towards this level this 11 dollars. so what i would look for is i would actually look for pullback days to get in this one of the things that i i can recommend and that that has worked for me on SPACs, guys is trying to get in on the day that so what i do is and this is normal i try to get in on the day that it's actually weak buy into weakness versus buying into strength this is a very important thing for SPACs because when you buy into strength a lot of times you get caught at the resistance but when you buy into weakness you can measure that support and try to get in there and then give yourself that multiple layer support approach where you can set the risk right underneath it and that's the approach that i would take here for a stock like gnpk is trying to get in as low as possible giving myself a tight risk and a good window for that return all right guys let's keep going through here uh we got a couple more for the day we got about 15 minutes left so definitely let us know what you want to see i want to keep running through here and and and, and knock down some more stocks here uh so uh let's go into an ipo you know we haven't taken a look at ipos in a little while chris um and you know that's something that we try to do here is not only be about SPACs, guys is be about maybe some ipos so i haven't taken a look in a little while how's the wolf doing you know what let's that find out either how, how are we doing oh this chart looks good to me baby i'm getting excited i, I love when i see charts like this guys so l look how the the trend line is, is starting to stick a and what do you get here guys so you get a bottoming action here bottoming action here and then a quick turnaround like it, it looked like this is a harmy candle it looked like it was trying to break down and come back towards this support but immediate reversal here. So that 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 get me excited there, you know, we're, we're approaching towards this kind of trend line, but one thing you notice is these high wicks. High wicks means selling pressure when it gets towards the resistance. So see if you see a big time seller showing up at let's say 27, 2750 just trying to get out. And so how do you do that guys? Is you look at the market depth 
and this is so important, guys. And, and, and you know, a shout out to my man Dennis Dick out there. You know, he talks about this all the time, guys. If you don't know the, the market depth, you can't find the big buyers, the big sellers. So you don't know truly where the support is and truly where the resistance is. But if you can get that full access, that full market depth, that's when you can start finding these big boys. And and I really, what I do, I try to beat the big boys. If I see them hanging out there at, let's say, they had an order out this morning at 26. I'm putting my order out at $25.90 and I'm going to be trying to be 10 cents below them and then measure my risk to give me an advantage to feel that I, hey, I beat their price. Uh, I'm, I, I beat the big boy. Now, I know my risk. Let's see if the big boy can bring the stock back up for me because it's usually not my shares that bring the stock back up. My, you know, my, my 100 shares, my 50 shares isn't going to really be, be driving up stocks. But when there's someone hanging out there and they put an order out for let's say a million shares or a hundred thousand shares, five hundred thousand shares. That's what I'm looking for. That block, that block, that big boy. And then I'll take advantage on that that guy, and, and I'll, I'll try to take my money away from the basket because at the end of the day, that's what we do, guys. We put all our money into a pot, and that's how kind of you, you got to view stocks. Everybody throws their money in the in the pot. The question is, who's taking their money out? <laughs> is it going to be you out there? Because you had the plan attacked, or is it going to be the other guys because they're taking that plan attack and then they just sweep it underneath you? And, and, and that's truly the market, guys. You know, a lot of people talk about these short sellers and, and kind of the battle. Chris, I, I know that you probably kind of see, seen this is that there's always a battle. Someone's making money and someone's losing. Yeah, and you know, as, as you pull up that chart, I, I can't help but think back to when we did the Benzinga boot camp, right? And we talked about, uh, chart patterns for SPACs and for IPOs. And this this chart right here looks very close to what we did for IPOs, right? Mm -hmm. A huge volume on that first day and a huge rip up. And then everyone, you know, it started trading down and volume got lower. The share nope. price came down. So now we're looking, you know, for uh, volume to increase and for those shares to go back up. Unless if you can get in at the actual pricing on an IPO, buying an IPO on day one is is usually not the best bet, right? Because normally we see shares trade off over the next couple of days. So that's something I'd caution again with these IPOs, you know, and for me, I own STIC, uh, which is the SPAC taking BarkBox public. And, you know, again, nothing against Petco. I think there's great opportunity here for several players but the pet market is is huge, right? What, what was that ticker again? Just so, so I can put it up. Uh, repeat. I could. I, you were breaking up there. S T I C. S T I C. The stick. The stick life. The Northern Star. So again, the pandemic. More people went and got pets, right? So the mm -hmm. pet market actually actually grew. So long term, the outlook on the pet industry is very very bullish and a huge total addressable market. So again, it's about knowing your entry prices your risk reward and the and the timing. So, you know, I, I couldn't have said it better myself, Mitch, you know, talking about setting those those limits below and everything. So again, you know, pay attention to these charts. So the the story and the technicals. And you know, as I said, we talked about this at the last boot camp we did. I'm gonna drop the link in the chat again. We do have a SPAC event coming up where we're gonna get into more of those technicals, more of that basic investing knowledge, you know, for for some people out there to really learn. Um, you know, the ideas for, for these SPACs. So, um, you know, and go ahead, Mitch. I, I see you got another IPO up there that we've talked about before. Yeah, so this one's Pub M, guys. And this is one that I mentioned for, for a while, guys, because I, I like the industry that it's in. It's in programmatic advertising. And I've said that wrong plenty of times. So that's why you guys saw me focus there. <laughs> uh, so one of the things is that you're starting to see, guys, and, and, and this is streaming service talk and, and we'll have some streaming service show uh, coming up on pre-market prep soon so definitely tune in that day because we'll, we'll talk all streaming but one of the things that i've seen in streaming and chris is that how are they going to get the advertisement to us and how can they personalize advertisement to us because to tell you the truth when, when, when like uh, you know i see an advertisement of let's say etsy doesn't really get me excited M might get someone else excited but it doesn't really get me excited. So personalization of ad targeting is going to be a big, big focus 
of media companies because what you want to do is give the ad towards the person watching not not give the ad towards you know just just anybody you know just just oh i'm going to i'm going to try to push chris on ballet classes it, it probably wasn't going to work right but if I go and I tell Chris and I, and I show him investment research ads, if I show Chris uh, maybe some SPAC services ad or, or, or maybe some, some like Benzinga Pro ads, next thing you know, Chris is clicking on those ads. And so that's where we come into the story of programmatic. And one of the things that happens is this undercut and rally. This is the one thing that we're seeing often. The cut underneath the low of the opening day and then the stock comes back. Then the IPO comes back. So let's go back to Woof so you guys don't think I'm crazy here. Look at Woof. What did it do here, guys? It broke this line right here. It, 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 when it broke this line, that's really when I, I, I would have started paying attention to it because the undercut and rally comes into play. And, and that's what I'd be looking for. Um, let's look at Airbnb. Uh, you know, that's what's the ticket for Airbnb? I I don't even watch this one that much, but ABNB. ABNB. All right, there you go, guys. So let's take a look at the, one of the bigger ones. What did it do, guys? Opening day. Cut the low. It cut the low. Right here, and then what happens, guys? Hold rally. This common, common, common pattern that we're seeing, and so I just wanted to point that out, so that so that people can start seeing that. You know, uh, what's the other one? Dash. Let's take a look. Dash. What happened, guys? Cut of the low. This whole area undercut in the low. When it reclaims that low, you get that push. You get the driver set. This, this is what, what what I look for, guys. And, and to find patterns, you gotta be looking at those charts. Charts, charts, charts. And, and one of the things that I like to do is start like telling myself like, okay, so now I see this pattern. Let's see if the next IPO repeats it. And so that's, that's called like identifying the pattern and then testing the pattern out. Not testing it by money because you don't need money to test these patterns out. All you need is the charts. New chart to start, a new IPO, see if it undercuts, see if it comes back, See if it holds that level clearly, and then you can start looking back at all the data and, and see like, hey, so Wolf did it, Airbnb did it, Dash did it, boom. And next thing you know, you notice, hey, nine out of 10 of these stocks are doing it. So this pattern happens 90% of the time. Now I can start attacking this. And, and so that, that definitely can, can start leaning you towards finding patterns. And, and we do this for SPACs, guys. We, 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 we look for the first wave before, like at the announcement. And, and then we look for that merger, that, that affinitive, definitive agreement to come out or some rumor to really drive it. And, and, and that's where we really seen a lot of the, the value in. So to, to kind of give touch to that, that's why Chris and I say to get close to that $10 price point. Right, Chris? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's about finding those entry points. Uh, you know, that that's what we're trying to do here with the knowledge. And, you know, I, I got to remind people. So we have an interview tomorrow, right? Another CEO interview. So we have Patty Cook coming on from Finance of America, going public with RPLA. And, you know, if you look at that chart, this is one that's trading below 1050 and they have an announced merger deal. And it's actually trading below or close to net asset value right now because you get the $10 plus interest. So this is one where, you know, you, you, you gain if the steel goes through, because I think it's a great company in the long term, or, you know, if you, if you don't agree with it or those shares, you know, the deal doesn't go through, you actually make your money back. So you have very low risk right now. So instead of chasing these SPACs up in the $15 range with no deal, um, you know, you have SPACs trading under 11, with no deal, or in this case, you have one with a deal trading under 1050. So know your risk, know your reward. So are you going to make as much money off of RPLA as maybe you do off of an electric vehicle company? Probably not. But is your risk lower? Absolutely. So risk reward, guys. And you know, that's why I know Mitch owns RPLA. I'm looking at getting into this one. Um, but I don't want to buy shares until after our interview tomorrow. Um, you know, just because I'm talking about it right now. 
But, you know, this this is a great long term one, again, to play that mortgage market with the Rocket and the United Wholesale. And as we'll find out from her tomorrow, you know, they're they're in several areas, um, you know, away from mortgage as well. So I think there's some growth there. So risk reward, guys, that's what it's all about. Yeah, definitely. You know, we actually got mentioned of a question there by Siggy Me. He said, where do you where do you start with SPACs? A, a lot of it is like kind of this led up to its movement. And so one of the things that we've noticed is before we kind of noticed that you could have got into these on the rips and, and, and kind of measured your risk and maybe been quick to the media, maybe faster than the, than the news coming out. But one thing that I've definitely noticed, I don't know if you noticed this, Chris, is that I've seen lately... Uh, I can't catch those rockets, but one thing I can do is get in near that $10 price point and, and just sit and be patient because when, when you're patient, at least you understand your risk. I was talking about this and, and shout out to my man, Carl in the chat. Uh, I was talking about this yesterday with him on the phone. I said, you, you know, one thing that I do in RPLA is not stress. I don't stress about this position. I really don't. And there's not many positions in life that you're going to be able to look at in your account and not stress about it. Why do I not stress about it, guys? Because I'm so close to that $10 price point. And because of that, I understand my risk. And when you understand your risk truly, truly understand your risk, that's when you feel comfortable. And so a, a, a clear definition also, when you're super uncomfortable in a position, maybe you have too much in that position. And you need to reassess the, the, the emotions in there and why you feel that emotion, that high increase of emotion in that position of focus that I need to, I need to watch this position like a hawk. I, I can't let this go down. I can't let it go down. And, and the truth is, my SPAC, my SPAC portfolio, guys, uh, I don't know about you, Chris. Uh, I just look at it at the end of the day. I don't have to look at it intraday. I can relax because I know where my entries are. I know my plan of attack. And that's, that's what we do, Siggy. That's what Chris and I like to do to, so that we can get in at the best pricing. I mean, and just sit back, relax, and enjoy the SPAC show because that's what it's all about. Get on the SPAC train. Where, where's my man Choo Choo in, in the chat? Yeah, he was in here. Mitch, if you pull up uh, HOL, so if we want to talk entry points maybe on a, a deal, right? That's All right. Let's touch this one as our last stock. Let's touch this one as our last stock. Let's, let's get to this one before yeah, we get so, to news desk update. So HOL announced that space deal, right, with Astra. So the, the other thing we're seeing now is with these new brokers, you, you can get trading done at 4 a.m. in the morning on some of them, right? Mm -hmm. So these deals get announced. And some people can can buy before, you know, everyone knows about the deal. So if you look at like HOL over the last five days, this thing rocketed, right? It's a space stock, rocketed up on that deal announcement. And then by the time the market opened, it was, you know, trading down from those levels. And then we talked about it on the show. I said, you know, that I set a limit order for $14. It didn't get filled. But really, if you bought in, you know, you, you could have bought a couple dips there on that first day before this thing rocketed higher. So don't buy, you know, right on that news announcement. It, it, it more than likely will come down again. We're seeing that over and over, right? It rockets up on the deal announcement or the rumor. But then some people are comfortable, you know, selling and taking profits. If you bought HOL at $10 and it rocketed up to, you know, 18 or 16 on that announcement, Maybe you take some off the table or maybe you sell out of your position and move elsewhere. So then shares start going down and people can catch this on the dip. So watch your levels and know your good entry points. And that's what we try to teach here on the show. Yeah, definitely. You know, one thing you can clearly see is a clearly defined support after that washout. Um, so it washes out, right? And then reclaims the low here at 15. Once it reclaims that low, you're starting to see it back into this kind of trend here back into this zone and so once you get that you're looking to see volume and what did you get here you got you got in this one candle you got two million shares traded there on that 15 minutes and then that really gave it that kind of drive up that you start seeing one thing you want to see is it can can it hold support and create support after that that's really when you start seeing kind of this 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 line across one of the things that you start seeing is can it get above that line where it closed this kind of wick out and really start getting some volume. So today 
you can clearly see right out the open, 930, what happened? It broke that level and got volume to really push it towards the next spot. And, and that's a lot of times what you're going to see it, to get through the resistance is needed this kind of volume bar, like 2 million shares, 2 million shares traded on both of these pretty much. Um, so definitely keep an eye out on the space trade. Uh, you know, Astria is definitely one of the ones that I was looking at. I even had this company uh, as one of the companies I was following uh, on Twitter. So uh, definitely super excited uh, about this deal. Too bad I'm not in HOL because if, if I did get into this one, where would I have gotten in guys? I would have gotten in back when it was at $10. Because if you could have got in there at $10 and been sitting there, let's say 1018, even if you got in on this spike and you got it like at 1040s, 10, 1030s, at least you have a way to measure your risk down and then wake up one day with the stock up here at $16, $18. And, and that's why we keep telling you guys of this approach because this is a managed risk approach that you wake up and sometimes into the green. So definitely, guys, that's why we do what we do, guys. We, we, we want to keep bringing you guys the information. And that's really what it's all about, guys, because if we're not bringing you guys the information, then you guys can't make informed trades. So definitely, guys, if you guys want to give us some love, let us know. You know, in, in the chat, uh, if you guys look up or the description below, you guys can find our Twitter and hit us up after. And one of the things that Chris and I like to do is definitely talk to people after the show. You know, we, we, we look at SPACs all day long. So you guys let us know, hit us up. We'll let you know what we're looking at, let you know what we think. At the end of the day, we, we let you guys make your own investment decisions out there, but we try our best to get you the most information so that once again, and I'll say it, there's no average Joes here, guys. No average Joes. So definitely smash the like if you're getting value from the SPACs attack. Let everyone know where the show is to get all this SPAC knowledge so that, hey, everybody else can be informed. Chris, anything else? No, that's it. Again, remember, interview tomorrow, RPLA, Finance of America, CEO Patty Cook joins us on the show. Um, we'll be on at 11 a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. So and stay tuned. Great lineup of shows again today on Benzinga's YouTube channel. So don't go anywhere. Smash the like, hit subscribe, and stay listening all day, um, you know, and learn more from some of our great team members here. All right. Now, it looks like we're going to be bringing on the News Desk team. So I'll go ahead and I'll give my goodbye here with our lovely show outro. And we'll see you guys next time on the SPACs Attack. Bye, everyone.